Now, you're welcome along. So we are reviewing the Sunday papers as we do every weekend. My microphone's sounding a bit funny in my ears. Is it okay where you're hearing it? Yeah? <coughs> okay, grand. Must be just me. So, you're very welcome along. Sunday papers. We are here with um, Marie Crow, journalist and broadcaster. And we have Alan Ling English as well, editorial director at Iconic Newspapers. And author as well of Stand Up and Fight When Munster Beat the All Blacks, which we're going to talk about as well before the end of the hour. You're both very welcome. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. So your uh, front pages, uh, we have uh, Sunday Times front page and it's Leinster Bath, superpower, six try Leinster, brush Bath aside but Munster sh suffer shock defeat, I wouldn't say it was a shock defeat, but that's your front page of the Sunday Times, Mourinho brands Liverpool, the lucky ones as well, is a fairly common back page you'll see today. What he said was that uh, he's talked about how, I know the feeling well or another team, the feeling of the lucky ones where everything goes in your direction, they know how they beat Everton, they know that the last match the opening goes offside, they know that against Napoli in the last seconds they could be out. They have this feeling that I also had when my teams were top of the league and it looks like everything goes in your direction. <coughs> Back page of the uh, star then, uh, sterling work as City go top. So uh, lucky as well, Mourinho's dig at club title chasers. We have the back page of the Sunday Mirror then. Lucky ones, again, it's a headline they couldn't resist really. Mourinho, everything is going Liverpool's way at the moment. Then this story, pretty interesting on the back page of the Sun. So 90% is the big number. 90% of United's first team squad no longer back under pressure. Gaffer, that is according to an unnamed senior Manchester United player. Sunday Independent then, they're going with uh, Bath, losing heavily at the hands of Leinster yesterday at the Aviva Stadium. Uh, Mourinho, the other line out of his pre-match press conference was, I don't know, United transfer plans. He has no idea what they intend to do in January. And Guardio Guardiola praise for Sterling overreaction to racism storm as well. Guardiola talking about how brilliantly Sterling has handled the week. And then uh, Mail on Sunday, Blues Cruise, Leinster returned to form in Europe with impressive six-try display that puts an end to Bath's prospects. It was 42-15 if you didn't catch the score. And then finally, Sunday World, Santa's little yelper. That's Mourinho. Mourinho moans and groans as United head to Anfield, and he says he's no clue if he can spend in next month's transfer window. So they are your back pages. We might start with rugby. There's all the Champions Cup reports, obviously, as people might imagine, but it's David Walsh's piece on the back page of the Sunday Times, which caught your eye, my eye, everyone's eye really. It's not one that you'll read lightly and forget about, especially if your kid's playing rugby. Yeah, it's, it's quite frightening and I think um, probably the, the main thrust of it is um, he's talking about the increase in physicality and intensity and speed and strength and violence in rugby and he focuses on the recent tragic death of the um, Stade de France player um, Chauvin, I think is how we call him, or Nicolas Chauvin. And there's a line here that just jumped out at me. Um, it ju it's actually quite scary. Um, this poor young guy was, um, he died after a tackle and uh, David Walsh says, Siobhan, Siobhan's death was not a once in a decade accident, far from it. Four months ago, a 21 year old died after a pre-season friendly. And he goes on to kind of detail the other tragic incidences in rugby games or after rugby games, um, after tackles that have happened in the last few months. So. Yeah. Um, it's just quite frightening. Yeah, he charts almost his day yesterday going to a Premier League game and then coming home and watching Leinster Bath mm -hmm. back recorded and he's talking about the collisions we see. He says more and more though it's becoming a guilty pleasure. And Nicolas Chauvin, he um, was playing against Bordeaux for Stade Francais. He suffered a broken neck which led to a cardiac arrest which is just a dreadful way for anyone to pass and he was 19 years of age and the um, former Stade scrum half, Jérôme Fiol, expressed a lament. He said, too much violence, too many blows, too much trauma, too much shock. Let us return to the basics of this sport where it is unbearable to think that you can leave life on the field. And as you said, Marie, Walsh goes through a number of other deaths. Uh, Louis Frajowski, who died in a preseason friendly in a second tier French game. He was a France under 20 international. He lost consciousness, recovered, and then in the dressing room he started vomiting and emergency services arrived, but he died in the changing room. And one of their former players said, we're going towards more speed, intensity, violence, 
more and more difficult contacts and uh, they need to be avoided. And interestingly, the French sports minister has sat down with Bernard Laporte to talk about the issue of safety in rugby. They met last month, I hadn't realised that had happened. Mm. So I that's where we are. The second um, most interesting strand in, in, in the piece, Joe, I think is David Walsh is um, successfully arguing that the game itself is, is, um, is in denial about the uh, impacts uh, of this uh, massively increased physicality and um, pieces all the stronger for for you know the factual basis on which he mm -hmm. puts the, puts the argument out there. We all we're all familiar with um, uh, Dr. Barry O'Driscoll yeah. um, uh, and his uh, and his outspokenness on the subject. I hadn't been familiar uh, with the research project undertaken by uh, um, Patria Hume at the University of uh, University of Auckland uh, Technology. Um, where she argued very, very, uh, very, very effectively and, and very strongly that proportionately uh, more rugby players have had worse uh, brain health scores when they were analysed, uh, and she included in her report um, a pretty strongly worded statement uh, saying that to better address the implications for uh, player uh, neurocognitive health, we believe players should be aware of the potential increased long-term risk of cognitive impairment from concussion, concussion so that they can make informed choices about engagement in sport and, and the most interesting aspect mm. of that is that the paragraph was deleted uh, when the official press release was put out by New Zealand Rugby and World Rugby. Yeah, I thought that was extraordinary. So like, I mean, you, you boil that down, New Zealand Rugby commissioned Auckland University to do this study. The study finds that actually it is affecting your cognitive abilities if you play rugby. And then, as Hume half expected, he says, she's one of the um, doctors behind the study, the New Zealand Union, who commissioned the study, deleted that paragraph from her press mm, release. Mm, yeah. Now, the, the whole thing speaks to, I mean, Marie, um, who, who was quite a bit younger than me, uh, was asking me if my, any of my children, when we were chatting outside, had played rugby. and. Um, yeah, I, I do have a son, Jack, who played um, you know, underage rugby for UL Bohemians for probably seven or eight years. Really enjoyed it from the age of about eight up until maybe 15. Um, fantastic team building, great memories, friendships, um, great sport. Um, but towards the end of that period, I, I noticed that the game was becoming increasingly about power, about physicality, and that the children who were being sort of chosen for the teams were, were the bigger kids. Um, and I often wondered at that time whether any of the kids who were associated with, with Jack's team would ever make it in the game. And, and interestingly enough, one of them, uh, prop forward, um, did. You know, he got on very, very well. Um, he he got, got picked for Monster under 18s, Monster under 20s, Ireland under 20s. And earlier this year, he was uh, cut loose from the uh, the Munster Academy in the first year, about two months after a 118 kg 18-year-old uh, prop was imported from South Africa. Um, and I think the feeling would have been that Jack's pal wouldn't have been sort of big enough. So well, let's find somebody who is big enough mm -hmm. to withstand um, the game. So one kid who has been reared in, in Irish rugby uh, all his life Gets and has dreams of, of, of making it as a professional is deemed, I think, not to be big enough. So let's bring in, um, you know, a bigger beast from outside the country. And that's just the way the game has gone now. Yeah. Um, and um, and I think it's time to to look seriously at, at, at the impact of power because, as David's piece sets out, you know, there. This I, I spoke to Paul O'Connell and happened to be speaking to him on Monday. He was very very upset being. Um, mm working for Stad now. Yeah, about, where that, about where that 18 year old yeah. died, yeah. It yeah. definitely, I think, raises the question of what what's it going to take? Like, it obviously, when there's young people and they pass away, it often doesn't kind of filter into the mainstream. Mm. Like, it, 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 it tends to be, you know, a big name, a big story, a, a big player, like when something serious happens to them. Um, I have kids as well who play rugby and um, I'm almost embarrassed sometimes telling people that they play rugby. It's like I'm being a bad parent or that People are going to judge me because I'm letting them play rugby. Now, they're only four and six and they play down in Terenure and they love it and it's great and they're just running around mm. playing. The hits, um, hits aren't quite as big no, at four and six. No, they're yeah. just, I think the six-year-old might be learning how to tackle mm. now. Like, that's about it. But yeah. um, I now look at these uh, injuries and these tragic stories with, I suppose, kind of thinking of my own children with that in mind. And I remember back in September looking at um, Cornell Dupree, the Scottish um, back row, 
suffered this horrendous in- injury where he um, fractured the cartilage below his Adam's apple and he damaged his voice box and he was in hospital for four weeks and he couldn't speak. And I thought, God, this must be like the rarest thing ever to happen. So obviously I Googled it and, you know, I found out that these, you know, people can injure their larynx like quite regularly in rugby. So I just thought like the force that people are being hit with must be phenomenal. And, mm. um, you know, that all comes into my mind mm. when I'm reading these and when I'm thinking about it. And, uh, you know, I wonder what will the effect be on yeah. participation in time? But that's the really interesting question. So there's where, there's a few different strands. There's where rugby goes at the professional level, where it's bigger and stronger and faster. And will they have to change the rules of the game just to make that sustainable almost mm. for the players? And then there is what it does to participation because mothers and fathers all over the country will read a story like that and will think to themselves, well, is it worth it? You know, mm-hmm. does rugby give things that many other team sports also give? And mm-hmm. the answer is no. There's nothing, there's nothing unique beyond the rules. I mean, it's, it's team environment, it's going to keep you fit and strong and give you discipline all, and friendships, all the things yeah. that we celebrate. Yeah, it does rugby, all of those things a, quite wonderfully. To, yeah, apply to a I, soccer team or yeah. GA team or anything. The other side of that, Joe, is that some kids just really like rugby and they want to play it sure. and their heroes are Jordan Larmour and Brian Driscoll mm. and that's the route well, The other thing is it's never been more popular in the country <laughs> yeah. ironically yeah. and you yeah. have a story like that a big story like that it's never been more popular mm. But I think the game even in the last three years it's, it's just happening so quickly mm. that the physicality it's almost like a different game to the one it's certainly a completely different game to the one uh, that, that the amateur players played back in the 90s and the 80s uh, but I would even say from five years ago, it's almost a big, mm-hmm. a different game again now. It's just, and it's gone too far, I think. It's just... Uh, Difficult to row back on now, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and as David points out in the piece, you know, nobody has, uh, nobody has come up with a solution mm. to how, how do you stop this runaway train, you know? Um, how do you stop a situation whereby, you know, people's um, work in the gym seems to, seems to yeah. be... And uh, skills of strength yeah. and conditioning coaches yeah. and programs yeah. Yeah. and... And then you have a scenarios where we see in South Africa, you have this under-18 tournament uh, that has uh, recently produced six positive tests for mm. uh, um, anabolic steroids. Mm. And, you know, it's being seen, increasingly seen by parents over there. There have, there have been reports to, 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 ver- to verify this, that, that parents and coaches are sort of more or less turning a blind eye to it because it's seen as a, a way out, it's, it's seen as a, a, a means of getting a, a, a big money contract or a decent money contract. Yeah. And, um, and we're, we're buying into that. We're, we're, we're certainly importing plenty of players from, from, from South Africa, young players. Who knows um, you know, what, the, what the history of, of them has been. We know, we know we've seen one or two examples of, of players coming in who have uh, tested positive. And, and leaving again. <laughs> and leaving again quite, quite quickly. Mm. Um, well, they wouldn't have left if there wasn't a media true. foray, is the truth. True, yeah, is yeah, the, the media... The media that is the practical yeah, truth. Yeah, the media yeah. storm took 12 months to erupt, though, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And DJ, I, I think Grobler signed during a Lions tour. Yeah, yeah, and, and then he was quiet. injured for a yeah. sustained period. Yeah, and then when he started period, to play, so, and then yeah. when he left, he did say... But there have been plenty of others signed since then, and we don't know, really. I mean, coming from that, coming from that culture... Let's um, not name one, names one here. One would have to be... Uh, we won't know, but one would have to be, um, you know, uh, um, somewhat... Careful. Well, certainly it seems South Africa don't have their house in order, and there is a culture if teenagers are doing it, and there's adverse findings at the local talent mm. get together yeah. at that age. And as someone said at the time, I remember Martin Ziegler was writing about it. There was a quote from somebody saying, I mean, these are just the, those that we've caught. You know, you have mm. to be yeah. really pr- yeah, pretty yeah, stupid yeah, to get yeah, caught in some respects. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know because, well, as Walsh says, I mean, how do you row back? They've lowered the tackle height. That's fine. But I mean, a lot of the worst injuries come from knees hitting off heads, mm. low tackles, they're not going to get slower. Mm. They're only going to get faster, they're probably going to get bigger, stronger, yeah, more I, explosive certainly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there can't ever be a time where you say rugby isn't a physical game. Like uh, That is the game. Yeah, that is the game, but th- there, are, there are degrees of physicality and I think we've, we, have, uh, we have now surpassed an acceptable level. Um, and uh, even from a spectator point of view. I mean, you see some of these games are just absolute arm wrestles, slugfests, brutal, brutally um, demanding physical contests. They're enjoyable on one level, but I think um, French rugby, the French rugby that we all remember with fondness was the flair, the flair game. Um, not running into space as yeah, opposed to yeah. running at the man. Yeah, exactly. Back to basics. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Well, it's a terrible week. I mean, the publicity for rugby 
has been uh, bad because there was a minute silence held for this player before every Champions Cup game all weekend. So the whole rugby fraternity across Europe mm. has watched the minute silence and seen a 19-year-old's picture up on the screens around stadiums. So. Yeah. Does it get into the public sphere, though? I like, don't know. Does it resonate with people that might not be as interested in... Well, um, the, the, fear, the fear is yeah. that there's a minute silence and then nothing, you know. I don't think any parent could read this article lightly. No. Yeah. I, I think there will be some difficult conversations around brunch this morning in certain households. Like we might send back the tackle bag that Santa was going to bring. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, don't want you to, I don't want you to feel like a neglectful parent, and I'm sure, you're, you know, I'm sure it'll be fine, but there will be, po I think something like yeah. this does permeate through and people will talk. And yeah. And like everything in sport, it all, it all comes back to um, a need to win, you know, that's what it's all about, really, you know. Um, sure. Um, a totally different side of the end of the game is Caelan Doris, if we're sticking on the rugby theme mm. for a moment. So he's with Leinster, from Mayo originally, really interesting story, and he's made a bit of an impact of late and has spoken, it seems, to a group of Sunday journalists. So he's with Brendan Fanning in the Sunday Independent, Rory Keane in the Mail on Sunday, Peter O'Reilly has spoken to him as well. Mm. Um, they've all done, they've all gone at different angles. Uh, Brendan Fanning remembered seeing him mm. first in 2015 at a schools game and he asked someone who was watching, is there anyone I should be looking out for? And I guess it ties in with the conversation we've just had, but one of the uh, wise old folks on the sidelines said, your man over there pointing at the Black Rock number eight, straight into the Leinster Academy, he's a beast. The young man in question was Caelan Doris. So, I mean, he's from the most rural of rural mm. male. The language is interesting there, isn't it? He's a beast. It's a totally, it ties in what we're saying. Yeah, it's, yeah. Such, a, it's an important word when you're playing rugby, I think. Yeah, um, Yeah. this was interesting. Um, I, when I, There's so many young players now coming through as well mm. that it's nice to actually get these interviews um, with them. Like Rory O'Loughlin yesterday scored the try and I wasn't sure I knew too much about him. But, you know, when yeah. someone, because I've read this now, um, you know, I, I know all about where he's came from. Uh, the bit that I really enjoyed was the bit about um, his mum and dad being, um, I think they're psychotherapists, is it? Or the area. Yeah. And his dad done, uh, did this fascinating thing where he spent 40 days and 40 nights on the top of Crowpatrick. He's an artist. And he was asked about it. And obviously for the dad, like this was a really important thing, like a massive part of his career <laughs> and his life. And mm. um, Doris didn't really seem to know what he'd done. <laughs> so yes. I thought this was hilarious. It was such He'll a, a father-son father kind of thing as well. You'll kill me for not knowing this. It was kind of a conceptual art thing. <laughs> dot, 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 something. <laughs> I thought that was great. Yes, so he really enjoyed his father's work there. He his listened to everything he yeah. said. <laughs> his father's with Mayo County Council for uh, a number of years. It was a social sculpture where he interviewed everybody who climbed up uh, Crow Patrick mm. across 40 days and 40 nights, which sounds kind of interesting, I have to say. Pretty fascinating there. Yeah. I think all, all three journalists have, have done a, a good job on it, Joe. Yeah. Um, good content, though, from him. Good, yeah. Because I, I, it was well, a little bit different. Yeah. It's easy to imagine them coming away after the piece going, we've got something here yeah. that we can get our teeth into. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would think they do quite a few of these that don't always make it into yeah. Sunday yeah. papers. Yeah, without yeah. a doubt. I mean, interestingly, there are different aspects uh, about Doris in each piece that, doesn't, that don't make it into the, mm -hmm. you know, the others. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a sign that they were t picking and choosing their material. But it, what I find amazing, really, you know, coming from Limerick and, and, and Munster, where, you know, we're, 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 uh, we've got a good back row at the moment now, but uh, we, we don't have back rows um, left, right and centre, as they seem to have in, in Leinster. And, and the talk now is that he has already gone past Max Deegan, yes. who only uh, months ago was being spoken as, as, as the coming man of, of, the, of the Irish back row. You know, yeah. it's just extraordinary, the, uh, the talent that's being produced. Yeah. The fact as well that he's in college and he's um, studying psychology, I thought was quite interesting. And they, all three of the interviews that I read on him make reference to that. And the fact that mindfulness is a big part mm. of um, Leinster and what they do and uh, Conor Murray mentioned that recently as well yeah. he's into it seems it's they've all new thing now. sure is avocado and mindfulness that's what us millennials are yeah Joe, Joe Schmidt is uh, own the moment in front of your face yes that's exactly that's, that, that was Paul O'Connell's big <laughs> change wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah. That's he works it into his day every day like he finds mm. time to use the app so it's obviously almost a prescribed thing but yeah. like if he's studying psychology he obviously has an interest in um, in the mind and the workings of the mind and the effect that it has on performance. I suspect the reason Leinster have put Caelan Doris out at uh, the age of 20 is it looks like he's going to be involved at the RDS over Christmas. So you'll mm. see him against Connacht mm. potentially. So it, it's well, he's one to look out for, I think. 
Uh, he's from Lacken in North Mayo. He yeah. says, middle of nowhere, 500 people live there, 10 minutes from Kalala. They're 20 minutes from Balana, which is a proper town. He says, I grew up in Lacken, went to school there. There were only two people in my class. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Two people in my class of 35. Yeah. His parents moved uh, from Just Dublin. one person to throw the ball to. Unfortunately for Connacht, his father went to Black Rock College, hence yeah. the, uh, the Leinster capture. I wonder where you get that now, like, because there isn't as many boarding schools that kids might not be shipped off to the rugby boarding schools yeah. from the small towns anymore. Mm. And, and likewise with the hurling, you don't have the... You know, the St. Flannan's borders coming from all around Limerick and Tipperary. Will that be a, a, something that will die out? Because his brother yeah. went to King's Hoss for a while and then went to Black Rock as well. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. So that that's how he made it. His, skill, yeah. his dad went, went there and I think his dad performed. So it's a family thing. They all went mm. to Black Rock. And, and it is I, like, you know, life is just about circumstance, isn't it? I mean, if he had hung out in Lacken over mm. those four or five years of secondary school, he would not be playing for Leinster at 20. No, mm. no, no. no. That's so, thing um, for me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did uh, flirt a little bit with Ballina Rugby Club, but it was first year in Black Rock where he really seemed to get into it. So, that's Caelan Doris. That's worth uh, a quick read, and it seems like he'll be playing for Leinster over the uh, next couple of months. We'll come back to Ruby later on. There's a few bits and bobs there, and we'll talk about Alan's uh, update of stand up and fight as well to mark the 40th anniversary of 1978. But uh, for something totally different, Raheem Sterling has dominated much of the week. I am. I talked a lot about Raheem Sterling this week. It's been a huge story. Yeah. I certainly was interested to see how the Sunday papers would try and cover it. And it was a tricky one for the Sundays because this blew up literally this yeah. day last week. Yeah. We covered this on the Sunday papers last week because it was this time last week where Raheem Sterling had put up his Instagram post. Yeah. And it's kicked yeah, off it was a lot of brand um, new then, yeah. navel gazing and soul searching. But it is still very much a part of the conversation across the Sundays. Eamon Sweeney, I think we all thought was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, Eamon's was good because he kind of took a little bit of a different um, a different stance on it. Uh, I think he kind of, you probably sums it up a little bit in the intro when he says that Raheem Sterling is right about the media being partly responsible for the racist abuse he received at Stamford Bridge, but he's only partly right. The English media behaves horribly towards almost all footballers, not just black ones. Focusing solely on the racial aspects of this behaviour lets the perpetrators off the hook to a certain extent. So that was the intro to Eamon. And then he went on to kind of give some examples of where footballers had been treated terribly or um, and also maybe where their, I suppose, the public's perception is formed because of the way that um, they have been treated and David Beckham was one anyway that definitely caught my mind because uh, like I was a huge David Beckham mm. fan when I was younger and then when they started focusing on his lifestyle and his relationship and him wearing a skirt and um, all that came with that I kind of did go off him a little bit it was but so wrong wait, <laughs> <laughs> get it right I'm not surprised you knew that Joe but um, <laughs> it was after um, Eamon says that it was uh, 20 years ago David Beckham was sent off for a sneaky kick on Diego Simeone in a World Cup match after England lost to Argentina in the shootout and then Beckham was designated scapegoat for the defeat and the uh, derision that rained down upon him um, he was apparently the symbol of everything that was wrong with English society, a spoiled, superficial brat who'd let his country down. And, like, he says it was, uh, for a while, the coverage of Beckham was one long sneer, and it was. And, mm. um, you know, I, 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 as a young football fan, I definitely went off him because I was kind of buying into all of that. But it actually reminded me of, of something. The f it reminded me of um, Steve Staunton when he was manager of Ireland. And it was like he wasn't even a person, just all the, the language that was used. He was a clown, he was yeah, a muppet. Mm. Um, he was um, depicted as Kermit the Frog. You remember the, one of the tabloids sent uh, a reporter dressed as Mick P Miss Piggy to a training session to try and get a picture of him standing beside Miss Piggy. Like, that was mm. real life. Like, mm. he was a real person. And I remember being at the Aviva a little while ago and speaking to somebody that was involved with the FAI and they would said that the walls really started to go up between the media and the national team after that Miss Piggy incident, right. that the trust was gone completely because whatever you know relationships they'd had, where they travelled with the teams or they'd been around you know hotels, like it all evaporated after the tabloid yeah. sent Miss Piggy. So like we kind of forget that these are humans and mm. that they do have feelings and okay they're footballers and you know they earn loads of money but like is that the justification for them to be ridiculed in the tabloids just because they earn a lot of money and uh, like Eamon kind of references that quite a lot that you know fame is incidental to the real business of football which is helping the team to win matches and do they deserve this attention yeah. and ridicule mm. I, I think maybe the key line one of the key lines certainly in, in Eamon Sweeney's piece which I think is excellent is that uh, 
you know, there is a demand for this stuff. Uh, in reality, as he writes, papers hound footballers because the public likes gossip, mm -hmm. preferably of the discreditable um, variety. Um, and and we're, we're all guilty of that, by the way. I know. We are. Terry we are. Of course, we are. And, and and anybody who says, I mean, sometimes. As a local newspaper editor, I would meet people all the time will say, well, you know, if you'd only just put good news in the newspaper, yeah. you'd sell a lot more. Absolutely rubbish. Rubbish. You'd be out of business yeah, quick you'd be in out no of business. time. Yeah, yeah. It's complete, complete nonsense. People do want to read this stuff. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of the debate, I think, has been this, the how the football um, reporting community has sort of split on the issue. Mm. And there have been some very uh, reputable um, and respected journalists like Jonathan Norcroft in the Sunday Times, Henry Winter uh, in the Telegraph, coming out and backing Sterling very, very publicly. Um, and I turned to some of the tabloids this morning wondering, you know, was there going to be a response? Um, what, uh, what did they have to say? Because it is, it's a very interesting issue. You know, they've, yeah. been, they've been accused of stoking this thing up. Um, and we have in, in um, the Mail on Sunday a very thoughtful piece by Jermaine Gina saying, you know, a player of, of, of a generation, you know, not you know, maybe 10 years ago, Jermaine Gina. Very was, recent, was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very recently. Saying he didn't feel he had a voice. Um, saying that he was um, appreciated the kick racism out of football um, um, campaign. And, yeah. and, and, but, but that it was ultimately ineffective. And then with one post... Uh, Sterling had opened the debate, but it's a debate I think that's only being uh, had in, in in one section of of, of the of the media. I mean, that, did you see anything in the tabloids? Well, well, the only thing I saw in the tabloids, really of, of any note, um, Andy Dunn in the Sunday Mirror, who who goes under the moniker Britain's best columnist, um, has a, a tiny little piece at the bottom of of, a, of his page with with three paragraphs. Uh, ultimately dismissing the significance of the Sterling story and saying uh, that uh, the news that, that, that um, Lord Herman Owsley from the Kick It Out campaign was stepping down was of more significance. Now that was a significant story which is addressed um, uh, by Danny Taylor in, in a very impressive piece in The Observer also in the Sunday Independent. But this, you know, for me, here is the, uh, here is the red top media being accused straight out um, in by far the most, I think, um, significant story of the sporting week. What's the response? Almost non-existent. Um, one has to rely on Rod Little in the Sunday Times to get some kind of a counter view mm. in a piece that um, I think is, 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 is poor. Um, yeah, yeah, so Rod Little, Raheem Sterling's reaction to racial abuse was very admirable, but he is wrong to blame the media is Rod Little's uh, point. He does say, uh, we must consider now whether or not invisible bananas exist. It's hard to tell what with them being invisible. Invisible bananas are what John Barnes reckons are flung at black footballers these days in lieu of real ones. And I guess he tries to tease out the issue. He says on the specific, you know, so Sterling has, a, has accused the um, press of overt uh, racism. On the specific of the issue says, uh, Rod Little, I'm not so sure and he brings up the questions that were put to Sterling over the AK-47 tattooed on his leg, mm. and he says, the press was correct to question the appropriateness of this adornment at the time when young black kids were, being, were killing each other in the streets of London, and Sterling in the end was given a pretty easy ride by his bosses. And he said, uh, even more to the point, do newspapers pick on black players consciously or subconsciously? He says, I don't remember Theo Walcott or Daniel Sturridge being vilified by the media for their lifestyles, but I do recall one or two white players getting a good kick in from time to time. David Beckham, for example, or more recently Jack Grealish. So that's his argument. I mean, well, I, I think, there are I think his be argument other is examples. And, and there was Paul McCarthy had a brilliant piece as well. Well, it wasn't even a piece, it was tweets. He's the former News of the World mm. sports editor, and he was talking about. It was a long thread, it's worth reading, but he talked about certain things, you know, uh, bling was very much a code, it was dog whistling for mm, mm. black I did players, read that to extravagant it. lifestyle, and he said, yeah. there are black players who quote, in the eyes of certain quotations of the media, know their place, Yeah, yeah. and therefore they're not attacked. So it's not, it's never going to be, as Rod Little kind of tries to reason, it's never going to be every single black player will mm. be targeted, and no white players will be targeted, that's not how it's going. And to I think it. he lets down his argument by a throwaway line, but, but also a telling line, he described the uh, Sterling Post as heartfelt, if not entirely literate. I mean, that is just yeah, pure no snobbishness, that, yeah. it's just... Um, it's mean. Yeah, mean, yeah. mean-spirited, and um, 
pretty symptomatic of the overall piece, really. Do you know what? Look, I'm with Eamon Sweeney on this, and it's, it's borrowing a touch from Little, but there, there is just an overarching culture about the coverage of footballers, which obviously includes the issue of racism. And Jermaine Genus says, you know, even if we had a sense in my generation, we knew we were best keeping our mouths shut. You might have sensed there was negativity, but um, you didn't want to take it on. So there is something there, and yeah. you have to listen to black players. But yeah. I, yeah. I'm Bellamy totally with Sweeney. Joe, yesterday. Sorry. Yeah, Craig Bellamy came out yeah, yesterday yeah, yeah. as well, and um, he was uh, speaking before he was on Sky for the debate. Yeah. yeah, and he, uh, same thing, had issues with the way that he was portrayed Covered, and yeah. felt that he couldn't uh, speak out. But um, Jermaine there mentions social media as well and the power of it because mm. you're kind of you're in control of what you say and he references that he didn't have a, he didn't trust the journalist he didn't trust the media to say what he felt because he thought it would be twisted. Well, he said if I if, you know I wanted to dispute stories says Genius, but you think about doing an interview and you feel well if the interview goes badly it'll mm. be yeah. just <laughs> ten times worse again. But I think I, mean, I said this during the week and I totally think it is the case. I think what's happened with Sterling and black players fits into the bigger picture of how mm. footballers are covered. So he says, you know, um, there's a sense of who are they, these uneducated, who are they all footballers, by the way, not just black footballers, who are they, these uneducated working class lads yeah. with their big money, their adoring public, their flash cars, their big houses, their model gar girlfriends, who do they think they are? And he says the attacks on footballers are often rooted in not just jealousy, but in snobbery. Hence the frequent description of footballers' wages as obscene when um, compared to, you know, fund managers, bankers, mm -hmm. aristocrats and so on. He says, in the end, it boils down to class hatred. Sections of the English media dislike footballers of all creeds and colours for the same reason the Tory party dislikes the Irish. Footballers don't know their place either. Mm -hmm. And I think that explains how we have the Sterling situation and also how we have the look at Wayne Rooney and the mm. way he yeah. lives his lifestyle. Yeah. It's the working class council estate kid, mm. how dare he have all this money and live this way. And this is what happens when working class people get all this money. Yeah, yeah. He's still pissing in an alleyway mm. or he's buying a flash car. Yeah. And I think the Sterling thing is part of that bigger uh, picture. Yeah, and I think the, I mean, I don't want to overly disparage um, red top journalists, but I don't think they, ha I think they were unprepared for the post, I think, it, and I think he, it was, if, as many people have said, a brave one. God no, it could have gone, could, mm. it could have been received in, 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 he had no idea how it was going to be received. He had no idea he was going to be sort of hailed as somebody who was a bit of a game changer in this, mm. in this debate. Um, but I don't think they've been able to really comprehend the underlying issues that have, are emerging um, b because, of, because of the response that we're seeing here. And it's, it's a pity that nobody really in the section of the media that that is standing accused has has for what I've seen certainly yeah. certainly today um, are certainly today because I, yeah, it's yeah. been a long week and there have been some pieces there was a Sun sports journalist football journalist whose name escapes me I'll dig it out but he wrote a piece during the week and it's brave because he did say he looked at some of the coverage in his paper often more towards the front mm. end of the yeah. paper yeah. news journalist and he said he felt a bit uneasy and he felt there was a tonal difference between Sterling and maybe what a white player might get. Mm. It was a brave mm. piece, right? Brave he, piece, he did, yeah, yeah. He did write that on yeah, Wednesday I didn't or read Thursday. That. Yeah, yeah, fair play. The issue as well, though, is that like, it's name. not like the, peep, the, the journalists who write for the back of the paper are working off the same uh, school of thought as the people who write for the front of the paper and like there's very little connection between the sports mm. journalists and the news journalists especially now everyone's always out and about or working from home or working from mm. um working mobile so like they're two different they're they're two different um types of journalists as well but they're all been lumped in mm. Mm. under the one umbrella as well yeah. which is quite unfortunate and like i know i have friends that work for red tops and they get really annoyed when there's something in the front of the paper about the lifestyle of yeah, a player sure. and you know they feel that they're their craft and their trade suffers because of um, just association. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's difficult for them. We'll see how it all plays out over the next while. I mean, I would think this will die down and not much will change. Uh, yeah. There will be scrutiny of stories now, I think. Yeah, did you see mm. what else? Well, it's, I'm, I'm glad we've had the debate because yeah. it has raised it onto a level that we haven't really um, mm. seen. And it, like, it, some big voices have lended themselves to it as well. And um, Jermaine mentions there that, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about the kick it out, but it has to be more than just a slogan now. And I think Jamie Carragher made a good point um, on Monday Night Football saying that just uh, uh, for the racism as a whole, that 
you have to be, it has to become uncomfortable for people to write these things and say these things and do these things mm. in stadiums and, and that's just going to take time. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully it will be uncomfortable. Um, and we, we, and when the first reaction when we saw the, uh, the little video clip and the photograph was the, the, the guy who has since um, apologised for his actions and claimed it wasn't being yeah. uh, racist and he used mm. the word mank instead of black. Um, but still, whatever about the language that was deployed, it was the hate yeah. in his face and, and that has been a characteristic of um, <clears throat> Premier League games um, and, and, and before that first division games. I remember being a, um, back in the day, uh, I'm a Tottenham Hotspur supporter, being on the shelf. Condolences. Uh, thank, well, uh, not, not so much now, yeah. Joe. You know, things are, things are on the move here, you know. <laughs> it's about to blow up in your face, <laughs> I suspect. No, not at all, not at all. In, in, in Potch we trust. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I was on the shelf, which was uh, now long since demolished. It was the hardcore Tottenham supporters in the East Stand. Right. And there was some segregation. There was some sort of iron railings um, seg segregating one side of it from the next. I happened to defend Gary Stevens, who was um, a midfield player for Tottenham at the time in the late 80s. He was getting horrendous abuse from a pocket of supporters just to my right. Mm. And uh, I just sort of shouted over to a couple of them, you know, shut up, um, support, support him, he's a Tottenham player. And I mean, they practically tried to climb over the, uh, the pen to attack me, mm. you know, one of, one of their own fellow supporters. Abs kind of, with the kind of hate on their faces, that was what we saw in this, this, this you know, prosperous looking gentleman, uh, if you could call him that. Who's lost his job, according to his He's lost his job, and, and rightly so. I mean, I don't think any employer would, would want somebody on their books who's capable of that, that kind of behaviour. If we segue away from that, there is a way to do it very easily. Memphis Depay has given, I think, a really interesting yeah. interview. Memphis Depay for Manchester United fans is just a byword for the post Ferguson era, era where a glut of seemingly very ordinary players were brought in by Moyes or more so Van Gaal, didn't do very much at the club and are either still there picking up loads of money or have uh, moved on. And I hadn't given too much thought to Memphis Depay, I must say, yeah. Until since we saw this lovely on. picture of him with his uh, very flamboyant shirt and he looks like he's having a whale of a time yeah. there on a yacht the somewhere lovely. The photo would be described as bling, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the photo is in keeping with the piece, That's though. The yeah. That is yeah. the amazing thing. Yeah. And because it ties I him came away from reading yeah. this piece yeah. feeling really sorry for him. <coughs> yeah. But then I looked at him on his yacht and I forgot about that again. But yeah. He's um, in kind of a silk shirt, black with like gold pattern on it and some silk shorts and what looks like some kind of French Riviera. Looks lovely. <laughs> is situ backdrops behind him, the blue is uh, very blue in the sea and he's got the sunglasses on and his phone and you think and he looks delighted with life he is just <laughs> delighted and it turns out he is a completely different character to what the picture would suggest really surprising yeah yeah he says in the piece that uh, there was a um, a picture of him a, a depiction of him in the in the media as a party boy um, he said he went out only once in one and a half years in Manchester and it wasn't even fun um, <laughs> and uh, he's very comes across as very thoughtful. So, so there is a there is a bit of a link there to the whole Sterling thing. Um, a player who I think, uh, in a way, you could sort of say is one a byproduct of all that is wrong at at, at Old Trafford. Um, somebody was brought in for a lot of money. Uh, one of many Manchester United players who've been bought for tens of millions who, who, who just haven't, um, who haven't delivered for different reasons. And there's a little, sometimes... Um, I should just tell people, by the way, the reason he's here is because he is knocking things out of the park for Leon. Yeah, so yeah. He's yeah. played 84 league and European Cup games since he left United. 84 games. He has scored 33 goals and had 33 assists. Mm. And he says, Leon allowed me to be who I am, to be free on the pitch and outside as well. So that's the reason exactly. North Craft has yeah. up with him. So, and the whole thrust of the piece really is that he's now in an environment in which he can be himself as a, as a person and as a footballer. Sometimes um, uh, graphics in, 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 uh, in Sunday newspaper articles aren't worth the space that they're given. to given. But in this case, we see quite starkly his, uh, his career record before he joined Manchester United, 50 goals uh, in 124 appearances. His, uh, his record after it, as you said, uh, 33 goals in uh, 91 appearances and, and 35 assists. And then seven goals in 53 appearances for United. So 
Going back to my point about Pochettino, who Manchester United would obviously love to have as, uh, as their manager, I am absolutely convinced, having recently read the Pochettino book, um, the diary, the, the year the in his life. one, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, terrific book. Um, underrated book, I would suggest. He doesn't like oranges, is that right? Who? who? Pochettino. Oh, Pochettino, yeah. They, bring, they have a... Yeah, yeah. They, they, they change the energy of a Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just, just the insights in the book are incredible. I mean, he... The, he, he his level of, of, of detail is, is Joe Schmidt-esque. And there's, uh, there's elements of, if we, if we were to continue the rugby analogy, uh, Declan Kidney, there's a, little, little bits of that, you know, he's a, yeah, but, but I'm absolutely convinced that if Tottenham had signed this guy, he would now be playing um, first team football and a star in the Premier League because he would have found a manager who understands him mm. and who, who can create an environment in which um, an obviously talented player yeah. can flourish. And he says himself, like, he needs to be happy, like, yeah, he was yeah, trying too yeah. hard when he was at Manchester United. Yeah, that United. was very interesting. Yeah, that he was, um, he was outside practising his uh, kicks with his left foot. Was yeah. it when Ryan Gig with Ryan yeah. Giggs, when yeah. Van Gaal was like... Pulled him up. Stop training yeah, so hard, yeah, stop yeah, your, yeah. you know, that's fine, you need to get your head right. But um, what I thought was really interesting was that, you know, it took him so long to be comfortable with his... Um, with his personality and you know he's not just the kind of um, one-dimensional footballer he likes writing songs he likes elaborate clothes he likes glamour music and um he posts he's a sensitive christian and, yeah mm -hmm. and soulful mm -hmm. messages um and he's no longer hiding uh, the individual individuality is the key of life and just after i had i had read this um i was on my phone looking through twitter and roy Keane popped up on sky and he was saying that footballers shouldn't be interested in anything else except for football. So he's obviously on Sky today. Um, I think he must have been talking about the Man United players. And that should be their sole focus. Pogba, I would wager. Yeah, mm. the underperforming Manchester United players. And then there was Gary Neville. And Gary Neville was saying that um, Jesse Lingard shouldn't have launched his clothesline on the week. He his line of clothing, <laughs> clothesline, um, on the week that... It's a different clothesline from our lives. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, I better clarify what a clothesline is in a, in a sports chat. Um, his line of clothing on the week that Manchester United are playing Liverpool. So I think that there's probably, um, that this kind of highlights that there is, there is a generational thing now that mm. players are no longer, you know, I think when Gary Neville and Roy Keane were playing, there probably was only black boots that you could get, whereas now you can get all different colours boots and mm. players are um, they're exposed to an awful lot more things in life than than maybe Roy Keane and um, Gary Neville were, just in in terms of like media and what we have access to and yeah. all the rest, and that players are no longer just like Roy Keane and Gary Neville, that there are players now like um, Memphis here who wants mm. to be a little bit a little bit different. Yeah, like I don't think there's a massive generation gap in a way between, say, my parents' generation and my generation. Mm. It was, it, you know, in broad terms, as yeah. much as can be, it was a yeah. similar-ish existence. But of course, there's going to be such a generation gap with the first generation who've had mobile phones yeah. in their hands from yeah. year dot. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Like, like they're going to be wired yeah, yeah, no, so I, differently that, to Gary Neville and Roy Keane. That comes across uh, loud and clear in the Pochettino book that... Uh, he understands that the generation of players, the 18-year-olds, 22-year-olds, even 24, 25-year-olds, um, that he is trying to, um, you know, produce good football from, are a different yeah. mindset. Um, interestingly, uh, it, it, there's a point there I hadn't realised. There's some sort of clause in, in the deal when uh, Memphis Depay went to Leon. There's a, some sort of buyback option that Manchester United could get him back, yeah. Yeah. but it was absolutely pointless uh, in him going back into uh, into the environment that we have Miserable. Uh, there at yeah. the moment. Yeah, um, it was it was it was interesting as well to see him kind of say to Mourinho, like, I'm going to prove you wrong, like, mm. you know, you're going to want to buy mm. me back, like, mm. I'm going to get back to the top again, and like he's he's doing that. Another point as well was that I was um, I was reading the intro and. Um, what has changed for Memphis Depay, sipping coke and nibbling olives in Leon's old town? Like, what a great job Jonathan Norcroft mm. has heading yeah, off there to interview him. Yeah, well, he, he, he's... he's get big names yeah. every week, actually. Yeah, well, he's, across. you know, he's... he's um, I, I used to work with Johnny at the Sunday Times. He's a good guy, he's personable. Um, and I think he understands um, the mentality of, 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 of footballers. He had a great piece a couple of weeks ago with Robert Huth, which uh, Paul Cambridge was very yeah. frustrated with because uh, it, was, it was excellent. Yeah. Huth was every bit as interesting and giving as Depay is. Uh, Paul will be relieved to hear that there's a big picture and more space <laughs> given to this piece. Well, uh, you, you could argue that there could, should, could be more space again. Could, yeah. um, by, I by, did Almost by Sunday time standards, I'm saying here, which yeah, is maybe, maybe yeah. damning praise. Well, I, I actually heard um, 
Paul on, on, on the show that week and, and, and I absolutely agree with him. And, and uh, as it turns out, um, this week, Johnny Northcroft put out on Twitter um, a Facebook post which I would uh, advise any aspiring sports journalist to, uh, to track down and read. And it's, it's, it's a lot of advice and um, tips for interviewing um, sports people, particularly footballers. Right. And he did reference the Hooth piece um, said it was one of the best interviews he ever got and, and uh, as if to back up the Kimmich point said he was really frustrated that he only had 1400 words to do justice to the piece and he, he could have done with uh, double that you know um, and that is a little bit of a a little bit of a feature sometimes uh, you know frequently in the Sunday Times where you have um, a real meaty interview and maybe not and uh, the kind of space that would have been available um, yeah. back when, when when I was on the, on the paper um, quite some years ago that's just it. Our attention spans have dwindled. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're gonna have to pick through some of the stuff at, at relative speed. Stick with us for this one because Ellis Genge plays for Leicester Rugby Club. He's somebody who's maybe knocking on the door of Eddie Jones's England squad, and he's done a two-page spread mm. in the Mail on Sunday. We wouldn't normally pick out interviews with rugby players that most of us aren't that familiar yeah. with, but actually this is well worth a read, and uh, there's a, a, a nod to the week that's been with Raheem Sterling in his piece. Mm. Uh, effectively, he thinks that rugby has a massive class issue, and if you're working class, your face does not fit. Yeah, um, this is another good one, um, just in terms of kind of the intro and and, um, and what he got out of the player. Like straight away, I was hooked on this because um, because of his intro. Uh, Nick Simon said that he was in his apartment. So like straight away, right, this guy's got mm -hmm. something to yeah, say. Yeah. He's yeah. let yeah. the journalist into his apartment. So we're going to get something here because it's not a top table. It's not a press conference. It's not something yeah. that you're going to see in three other other papers. So like you could just tell and he even says it that um, he had something to say and that he was he was mm. upfront about wanting to talk about a couple of issues. Um, so yeah, he kind of details his own background and how he felt he struggled. Um, he struggled to get on teams and he puts it down to, to working class and, and not to race and to culture and um, like again there was a few times where I, like I felt a little bit sad for him a little bit little bit Mike um, Memphis and he says um, when I was younger I never felt comfortable sitting in the clubhouse having my chips and sausage because I felt everyone was looking at me thinking who the FUCK is this um, <laughs> and then he goes on now then he's obviously got very comfortable with himself because mm. he's wearing his gold tooth for the photo shoot in his living room mm. Um, if I turned up at the rugby event wearing a gold tooth and chain, I'd be judged straight away. Why should I be judged? This is what people wear. I like it. Mike Tyson was my hero. So, mm. so I'd say it's hands down the best interview Yeah. Uh, in all the papers today, Joe. Um, when I was 16, 17, 18, I never made any of the age group teams. When you think about that, you know, because where, where he's ended mm. up. I feel that's because my face didn't fit. I'm not white middle class, I'm working class. I don't want to put it down to race, I don't think it's about that, but I'll put it down to culture, the way people are raised and brought up. There's the private school mold in rugby, it's stopping the game from progressing, mm. it's painful. I have friends working in scaffolding sites back home who are quicker than Johnny May. That's where football and other sports have cracked it. Yeah, I mean, he just puts it all out there. I mean, no. it just, it's just relentless. relentless uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's, there's a line here, there's F all money in rugby, I'm 23, I've got zero cartilage, my shoulder has been ripped off the bone and I'm renting out this flat. And then he, he brings an Irish angle into it. Yeah. The guy who lived here before me, uh, Dom Ryan, Dominic Ryan, former Leinster player, retired at 28 because his brain was fried, uh, he means because of concussion, yeah. and he had nothing to fall back on. Who knows what I'll do? I mean, it's, it's, it's just he's remarkable so, um, honesty. He's, he speaks as well about his family. His uncle is in prison. Um, he's away for murder. He himself has got a few um, warnings from the police. I think in the past he's spoken about moving from Bristol where he grew up because of the bad influences um, on his life. He's got arrested. A few of his mates have got arrested. Um, and he's just so happy to talk about everything. He's like, you know, come on, get on with it. What do you want to talk about? Like, mm. you know, don't yeah. need to beat around yeah. the bush He says Eddie Jones calls him the gangster. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. As he does anyone who's not from a private school. That's that's going to come back to Jones. Mm, mm, yeah, mm, absolutely. That, yeah. Of all the lines in it, there's yeah, lots of lines yeah, in it. Yeah. But he says, Eddie Jones calls me a gangster and he uses that name for anyone who's not from private yeah, school. Yeah. There will be rugby journalists scouring yeah. back to check if that's true. And if it does happen to be true, then Jones will be asked about it. He's told as well, Leicester aren't going well at the moment. He was talking about flying back from Paris last week with people tweeting him about how poorly they're going. Yeah. And he says, uh, I know we've lost. 
I've got to sit in the plane and think on it for two hours when I'm caffeinated out of my effing eyeballs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, maybe Nick, given the O'Driscoll comments last week, it seems like Ellis Genge was in the mood to talk. Yeah. yeah. The painkiller yeah. issue might have been brought up he, there, I think. Uh, he, he brings yeah, it up here yeah. as well, yeah, because he, right. he doesn't, yeah. he can't he feel does. his kneecap. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's lose the cartilage. And he said, I took a few painkillers and thought, this isn't enough, but I stopped. Is there a drug? I was quite freaked out about it, but I'm used to it now. How many times do you not want to feel your knee anyway? I touched my left leg instead. Yeah. So he's. Uh, and, and it's not as if he was unaware that this was going to potentially become um, a talking point. The very first line of the piece, a, a direct quote, I've got a few things I want to talk about that might erupt. Yeah. But he, there was actually um, Rory O'Connor from the Irish Indo tweeted a quote from him yesterday, and that's why I my interest was piqued on this. Okay. So he seemed to do an interview as well yesterday, and um, he's just talking about loyalty in the game, and there's no loyalty in rugby, and managers get thrown out, and yeah. players go here and there, mm. and he doesn't play for he plays for his family and his friends because he doesn't know where he's going to end up playing. So that's on page eighty and eighty one of the Mail. Um, yeah. My yeah. first thought reading this was, we have to get this guy on the show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. Plenty to say. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mullen Octa were the story of the week in many respects. They were on the Late Late Show. They were great on the Late Late Show, by the way. Did you see it? I didn't see it. One of them got up, and it's a tough thing to do for a lad in your 20s. And they are, these are always stiff occasions where the whole team walk on and Ryan Tuberty's doing his thing. And friends, Tuberty can be quite good in those scenarios and do his best to put them at ease. One of them sang a Mullen Octa song to the tune of that Liverpool song about Europe which has blown up in the last while. We've conquered all of Europe. Yeah. Do 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 <laughs> and it was just slightly bizarre to watch the Late Late Show going nuts, clapping at the chorus bit and so he had a song about Mullen Octa's win. So they've enjoyed it. Um, they have, yeah. So how have the papers gone about it today? John Green ties their success in with the Porky Queeve controversy which is Mick Foley's writing about yeah. it and mm -hmm. Michael Clifford has a very good piece in it as well. Yeah. And you liked what Anne Sheridan did in the news section, I know, Alan. Yeah, as well. well, so well, well a few like, different strands. Yeah, quite a few different strands. I felt there wasn't, uh, in the sports pages, I, I just felt here's an opportunity for a um, potential award winning piece, you know, fantastic story. Uh, I, I didn't really feel that there was a. Um, a defining piece in, in any of the sports sections um, that I read. Um, Sunday Times didn't cover it at all. Um, Sunday Independent covers it. I think in probably uh, John Green had done a piece last week, last Sunday, where he went to Mullachta, yeah, yeah, yeah. so he yeah. probably had that box. Yeah, true, yeah. And John, John being, yeah. being from Longford, former uh, Longford leader journalist, does have a very thoughtful and very interesting piece. Um, but I, I, I felt that, uh, as, as you've alluded to, um, Anne Sheridan's piece, in uh, the Mail on Sunday, a double page spread in the news section covering every angle on it, um, just, a, just a small little nuanced details, um, the kind of piece that Anne is a former Limerick Leader journalist who would have spent 10 years in, in, in local journalism and, and knows how to... There is a skill, I'm yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. to find these little local angles. Excavating a parish. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And, and uh, done it extremely well, I think. Um, she, she's talking to one of the players who's talking about being up at half seven that morning with the cows. Yeah, that's now, not, right. Not to generalise, but the Kilmacud lads were all in bed at half seven. <laughs> they weren't up with the cows that morning. But we're always talking as well about, um, we're always talking about players, you know, being amateur and not getting paid and their expenses and, you know, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, then, yeah. You know, we're giving out to county mm. players just get their mileage and all the rest. But this lad here... Yeah. Um, Conan Brady, 28, now lives in Leeds and previously in Edinburgh, travelled home 33 times last year alone. He estimated that his travel cost between 2,000 to 3,000 a year or 12,000 to 18,000 over a six year period. That is a lot of money to come back and play mm, club football. Mm, mm. And you're, not getting, only you're, that, getting, you're moving towards your deposit for your house. Yeah, like, you're, you the know. dedication, the time, like the, even the amount of time is waiting in airports. Like, it's, that is a slog if yeah. I've ever heard it. And mm. like when he would have started six years ago, um, you know, like he wasn't probably starting off thinking in six years or when he started travelling six years ago, in six years time it'll be worth it because we'll have beaten Kilmacud in the Leinster football final. He was mm. just doing it for the basic, I want to play for my club, yeah. I want to, you know, leave a legacy, mm. I want to um, do the right thing for my club and, you know, just pure loyalty. It was really amazing. Yeah, wh what's good about this spread is, is there's just the multiple strands, you know, talking to the priest, to, to you know, focusing on yeah. the, the local school children, what it means to them, parents. parents. Yeah, there's a mother who can't watch, and so sec once the second yeah. half starts, she yeah. heads for the graveyard. And, and, and you, I have to say, Joe, you were being a little bit cynical outside before we went on, saying that you were a bit sort of uh, tired of, uh, of uh, you felt it was a little bit jaded. Um, I think the media can veer into real cliche here, and I think columnists who've never been in the parish mm. and don't know the parish can trundle out the same 
hackneyed stuff about what it means to the people yeah. and well, I, I just find it a bit repetitive. I, I wouldn't underestimate though what this means to, to, to the people uh, in this club and in this parish. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking more about the coverage as opposed to maybe uh, what it means to, yeah. them, especially a parish that small. Look, I'm sure around the pub over Christmas they're going to have the most lovely time basking yeah. in it and remembering it. Well, they'll be, they'll be remembering it in the pub over Christmas 30 years from now. Probably, and, yeah. yeah. And you feel it's made a big difference in Limerick? Oh, huge, yeah. I mean, in terms of the self-confidence in Limerick, um, how we see ourselves uh, in, in the GAA world now, it's mm, just been absolutely point, yeah. monumental. And, and, you know, so many different uh, individual stories, personal stories, such a longing for, 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 the, for the ending of the famine. Um, and it has just been, everybody's got a spring in their step. I mean, they say this, is, I, I accept it, it is a bit of a cliche, the no winter. Um, but it does feel like that, mm. you know, it's just been, it's been a joy to be from Limerick. Well look, I'll, I'll, I'll trust you, when, <laughs> when Kildare or Mayo win in all Ireland, I'll probably have Well, this is, this is an interesting question here. Um, John Green reckons that yeah. this story is the most heartwarming J story of the year, surpassing even that of Limerick's well, All-Ireland yeah, Hurling success. Well, Spoken yeah. like a true Longford man. You have man, a poll yeah. on that one, I'd say. Yeah. Look, J.P. McManus has bought this whole Ireland. Isn't that <laughs> what uh, I hear no, now? No, Is that no, the no, word? No, no. Let's put, he's put in place uh, some, 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 some good uh, academy structures. And, you know. Yeah, I know they've done a fabulous job in, in hurling down there. The numbers playing at underage is quite extraordinary. Like, so John Green talks about, you know, the GA needs to be at the barricades guarding against the destruction of rural Ireland. Uh, it's a great line. And he talks about how, you know, Mullen Octar, Leinster champions now, there's a fair chance in 10 years' time they won't even have a team. And that's yeah. where we are, you know, the demographics of the country are all shifting one way and it's towards Dublin. And then he segues out of that into Quite nicely. Yeah, a story which everyone's covered. Uh, he says, and if they do have a team, what sort of GEA are, will they be a part of? Because the dangers facing the association and its core beliefs were exposed with the extraordinary revelations in recent days around the cost overrun of the redevelopment of Porky Cueve. So they reckon this thing is going to be, and it's only really emerged in the last few days, we all knew it would cost a bomb, but they reckon it's going to be in the midst of 30 million euro plus what it was mm. adjudged to uh, come in on or estimated it would come in on in advance. I think it's Mick Clifford who puts that into context. Taxpayers' money, about 30 million worth has gone into this alone. So mm. basically every single cent of taxpayers' money, you could argue, has been swallowed up in the amount they've gone over budget here. So it's a very serious issue and there's talk of public accounts committee getting involved. Yeah. Because, and John makes the point, and it's been clear this week, clubs in Cork have sent questions into the county board mm -hmm. to try and ascertain as to how they've gone from a 78 million euro budget to in excess of 100 million. And there's no answers forthcoming. And John talks about the hubris of county executives. There's often a sense that board officers adopt a we know best attitude and that the debt run up by Cork County Board is just the latest manifestation of that. Um, Mick Clifford in the Mail, it's a really good piece. He makes the point that the new CEO Frank Murphy obviously outgoing and Peter McKenna in Crow Park has backed this up. They're basically going to be under a serious financial cloud now for the next 10 to 15 years. Mm. And this is a county where seemingly underage structures have been neglected for some time. And Mick Clifford makes the point, like, was the stadium even really needed when you look at what else is in, around Munster? Yeah. He, and he says, Kerry's six-pitch centre of excellence in Currens has eight dressing rooms, two physio rooms, auditorium, a gym, 30-metre sprint track, all of which cost seven million compared to the 100 million plus that Porky Cueve has cost. Uh, this thing has really blown up this week, hasn't it? John, I think, uh, used a really good word there, exposed, because... Yeah. I think it kind of nearly took everybody a little bit by mm. surprise. Like we, people kind of knew that it wasn't exactly perfect, and you know financially. But mm. like when you're looking at millions and millions over budget or over expectation, um, when it comes to debt, it's pretty shocking. Um, and I, John, uh, he actually did this piece really well because. You know, at the start it was really heart war heartwarming, and then you know we were all really worried by the end of it. But yeah. um, he uses the the quote here from Peter McKenna from the GAA. It became clear in the middle of the year that the amount spent on spent on the stadium way exceeded what people thought. Um, that was Peter McKenna told the Irish Examiner. And then John says, who though, because who did it become clear to? Because certainly the Cork GA family didn't know, which yeah. is the, that's the really worrying part. That like you've all these people in a county. Um, working really hard for the betterment of the of the of Cork GAA, and they have no idea what's going on yeah, at the top there's table. A big, there's a big disconnect, a huge, huge disconnect, yeah. and I think it's it's uh, it's something that ha that's very much widespread. Very interesting piece as well uh, by Mick Foley in yeah. the Sunday yeah. Times, and uh, you know, basically, one of the things he points out that is Cork is by no means a, a, 
uh, an outlier in this in that uh, there was a recently a piece in the Connacht Tribune uh, which Mazars, the financial audit uh, uh, company, uh, did an investigation into the Galway finances and, and found that they weren't fit for purpose. Um, and um, yeah, your point about J.P. McManus is, was, uh, you know, uh, probably well made. Uh, my, my joke. <laughs> <laughs> your joke, your joke, your little joke. But yeah, look, there's no doubt that um, we have in and we've benefited, you know, from... But it's been put to good use. It's been yeah. put to good use, so I, yeah. I have yeah. absolutely no issue with that because I, there was a report about the job that's been done over the last 10 years exactly in Limerick Hurling and even in the city. I think they've effectively doubled or even just over doubled the number of mm. hurlers in the in the city under the age of 14, 15. So yeah. Yeah. for me, that's a massive yeah, yeah, and success. And that's did it only well. good. A lot, a lot of credit uh, goes to Joe McKenna that's uh, right, yeah. for that. And um, I think Liam Brady made the point recently, didn't he, that um, um, Joe McKenna and the Limerick team went over to Highbury when he was in charge of the academy there and they sort of tried to learn from the best. And uh, in Pierce as well, though. That's entirely different. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's entirely different to this, where... But I mean, Galway Mick is Clifford's staggering. Talking about Galway, yeah, I think that's going to blow up. Yeah. Um, mm. The um, Porky Queef thing, 110 million, reckons Mick Clifford. And it was meant to be 70 million when it was first floated. Mm. In one of the articles, they, they make the point that um, Frank Murphy had said in 2014, actually, it's here, that um, we have taken a conscious decision, even though GA headquarters are still wondering about it, there will be no bank borrowing on the redevelopment of the stadium. So that's what he had hoped for, like, just in, you know, not that long ago. Mm. Mm. Frank Murphy, by the way, has been confirmed as the secretary of the Porky Queef Stadium Committee. This is just days after the overrun was exposed. So uh, last night, Cork's county convention confirmed the development, which will see Murphy take on a prominent role in the wake of his departure as county secretary, says Paul Keane. So uh, Frank Murphy will still be very much involved with the stadium. If the public accounts committee get involved given the 30 million euro of taxpayers money spent and you could think of many ways to spend 30 million mm. then that will be a big news day when I presume Frank Murphy would appear before well, them. Well certainly think. people need to be held accountable mm. for this. You yeah. Know? I just explain it for a start. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, one's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. no one's yeah. no, legally no one's suggesting something because untoward happened but 30, yeah. 40 million over budget when it's taxpayers money demands an explanation. And you mentioned that you know what everything that Kerry have there's six pitches and um, in one of the reports as well it says that there's a state of the art gym down there I've seen it but there's just one pitch and for like two or three years there when the weather was really bad we were hearing all these stories about Cork not been able to get any pitches to train in and having to travel the length and breadth of the county and some players having to travel two and a half hours from West Cork to try and find a pitch and like they only have one pitch now as well which is um, it just kind of raises another question mm, yeah. yeah yeah so that's that is uh, all over the papers today and uh, final story or two then um, books feature Tommy Conlon makes the case for Andy Lee in the Sunday Independent yeah very nice I mean Tommy's piece is uh, a little oasis of, of, of quality writing yeah, every brilliant, week brilliant after written. week um, just to and it's always something different as well with Tommy you know like yeah, for, he th he th I mean I know I, I know Tommy thing. well and he, yeah. he, he thinks long and hard um, well, about he's, he's what not, topic to write he's on he's not likely to write about Jose of a given no. week he tries to avoid yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in, in, and then he he has just a beautiful uh, way with words, and now I, I, I'm a, I've started reading the um, <coughs> the Andy Lee book and, and finding it su superb, a superb piece of work. I haven't read the uh, the uh, Amy McGee book, and and uh, I think that the piece is basically about that the the judges picked the wrong winner uh, in the Air Sport uh, Irish Sports Book of the Year of, of the award, um, and he he. He makes an interesting point that it's an occupational hazard for a ghostwriter to get too close to his or her subject um, and says it's unavoidable, but that in this case, um, the ghostwriter uh, of, of, um, of the McGee book um, gets, gets close to, had to get close to somebody who has lived a repulsive life and left a trail of victims in his wake and inevitably, uh, while well, there's a cloying sympathy left lingering on the pages for him, which uh, Tommy argues is uh, ill-judged um, and ill-deserved. I did have a thought on that, though. So, if Tommy has come away from reading the book utterly disgusted by Eamon McGee, which seems to be a common thread, mm. then how cloying could the sympathy have been? He clearly has been presented as a fairly terrible character. Yeah, well, I suppose one would have to... I haven't read the book now. Yeah. so It's, it's, just, it's a question yeah, I'm going to have yeah, as yeah, I read yeah, it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he makes arguments as well that really... 
Eamon McGee, unlike Andy Lee, did not leave, live the fight life. Basically, he was a part-time pro. His mm. chosen sport, chosen life, ran two separate parallel lines. So he says, the sporting story is spread so thinly across the book, it disappears altogether for long strangers. In fact, it only gets a passing mention here and there in the first hundred pages. Basically, it's a voyeuristic tale of one man's degradation with a bit of boxing thrown in as a hook on which to hang all the other sordid episodes. Mm. So for him, it's not a sports story, is his argument. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't read it either I haven't yet. read it either, but... Um, wasn't that the same argument that was made for um, Jackie Lynch's book as well? That it was Tony Ten. Yeah. Tony Ten. Yeah. yeah. That it was not a. Yeah, when well, I have read, I have read Tony Ten, and I, I wouldn't have any difficulty in, in, in describing it as a sports book. Um, I, I, my, my sense is, and, and uh, my sense is that is that the McGee book is is is, is a compelling and um, you know very very strong piece of work. But well, if the scene he paints in the opening of his piece from the McGee book is anything to go by. You literally can't put it down. It's <laughs> horrific. Mm, mm. He doesn't like. He doesn't make me not want to read it, though. That's the thing. That's he the makes thing. me want to go out and get it now. So yeah. you have to I, miss. Ironically, Tommy, I, I desperately want to read the Amy <laughs> McGee yeah. book now. Yeah. After that, yeah, but I, I think uh, everybody should also read the other two. I mean, I think the point he makes, and um, a, lot, a lot of people would agree with it, uh, is that all three books on, on the air, the Air Irish Sports Book of the Year Award mm -hmm. shortlist were, were all yeah. unexceptional. to be fair to him, international standard, he says. So this is not, you, there's always that horrible thing where you have to slightly talk down something brilliant to put your own case forward. I think the general consensus has been all three were yeah. genuinely excellent this year. Meanwhile, Declan Lynch, very magnanimous over in the yeah, main yeah, section. Yeah, yeah, always uh, very entertaining. Another actually. column that... Uh, I'd never miss. Um, yeah, he, he has a sort of a sidebar piece in his main column, which also has a sporting connection, where he talks about Gary Neville and the, and the Sterling issue. Um, but the, the piece that uh, I liked best was where he talks about uh, being a three-time loser. Uh, his baby. book, <laughs> baby, baby, his book was nominated for three different awards, and uh, he, he he didn't win any of them. Um, Only uh, Declan could write a column. Yeah, yeah, him. yes. I mean, the, 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 I mean, Tony. For those who haven't read it. Tony Tan is, is a superb piece of writing. I mean, it is just, uh, I, I like a punt every now and then. Um, I, I suspect that the, I have in me the possibility to, 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 to allow things to get a bit out of hand. Um, this, so this book did me a service and I could see how somebody who just started with one euro bet just became um, utterly, utterly uh, addicted to it and, and unbelievably well told. In, in that typical Declan Lynch prose, but the, the best line in this is uh, where he's sort of ruining, uh, or he's just pondering the possibility: would, would he would he uh, get the nod uh, for the uh, Irish Book Awards sponsored by On Post? Um, uh, and he says, uh, he says, uh, I would probably have been feeling quietly confident about uh, winning with Tony Ten were it not for the fact that, in the grip of a gambling addiction, one of us had stolen 1.75 million from the sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Ten being the, uh, the postman who... Uh, <laughs> I, liked, uh, I liked the use of the picture as well. It's a footballer with a Ronaldo-esque type body with yeah. a jersey over his head. And I presume it's because he just missed a goal or something like yeah. that. But I can imagine that's how um, Declan yeah. is feeling. But not, not, not a, I mean, having having sc scored a you know a, a fantastic line with that, he, he finds a way to make it even better. Then he, say, he he talks about a conversation we had a friend who's quite big in corporate Ireland, and he thought they speculated maybe on Puss would want to make a sort of statement about this being a, a moment of redemption, <laughs> and they might want to be associated with such a such a moment. And his friend thought about it for maybe a quarter of a second and said, no. No. <laughs> um, as the clock begins to come against us, uh, David Walsh is writing about Team Sky's uncertain future. Hugh Farley is, given the talent coming through, especially in Leinster, wondering about the possibility of a fifth province, an interesting thought. Though he's talking about it in Cork as opposed Jesus. to... Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking it'd be a Dublin thing. Yeah, yeah I well, I, look, it's an interesting... I think that the piece is... is, is uh, it was written because there's this huge uh, um, selection of players now who, who, who aren't getting a game for anyone and, and we're, we're offloading them to, to clubs in France and England and yeah. he sort of says maybe this, we have now the, the, the supply of players to make us a fifth professional outfit. Um, and the money, he says we might possible. have some money. Where, where it falls down, I think, um, and Hugh is uh, obviously good journalist, talented journalist, but a, a court man to his core. <laughs> And he's sort of suggesting that the, uh, this team should be based in Cork, which I think the sort of subtext to this is that the, um, the Cork rugby community um, have been upset um, by 
ultimately Limerick winning the sort of two-way battle where they yeah. had for decades, for, for many decades, uh, two bases. They ultimately had to decide Cork or Limerick. They went with Limerick uh, and that has left um, Cork people feeling a little bit disenfranchised. And I think franchise is a word that's also used in the context of maybe another professional team, but uh, I, I can't, I guess it's impossible to, to imagine a, a professional rugby team uh, based Cork. out of Cork. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dublin, Comp competing with Munster. Dublin, I was suddenly thinking, could be possible, actually, if things keep going. Like yeah, that. well, it's you not that, rush into yeah, it it's not that, you know, it's not that long North ago. side versus south side? <laughs> well, no, I, I think... Spitting Dublin GA yeah, into yeah, well, uh, might as well do think, the same with Leinster. Things aren't Rugby. always going to be as rosy as they are now, Joe. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And um, Mark Aller often pops up with really good boxing pieces in the mail. I, I didn't get round to this one. I'll read it later on. The McKenna Brothers you thought was worth a look, Marie? Yeah, it was. Um, it was Should really I know good. the McKenna Brothers? I think you probably will in the yeah. future. Um, they are two boxers. Um, they are brothers and they are fighting out in... Uh, California at the moment but it's interesting because um, he it's, from reading the piece anyway it seems like he went up there and um, he talks about the setup that they have in the back garden so the dad um, has built like a huge shed in the back garden and put in a full boxing ring a full gym um, everything that you could need to become a professional boxer um, so when the guys are home for Christmas they're obviously out there practicing all the time so um, I think it's one of those stories that we're going to Probably, like when I was reading it, I wanted to find out a little bit more Where about are they them. from? They're from Monaghan, just, um, right. uh, I'm not sure the name of the village, yeah. but um, somewhere in Monaghan anyway, so they kind of, um, they seem to be like the next, the next big next thing. Big There's thing. Their okay. one brother there is, um, one brother whose name is, uh, escapes me right now, is, um, He's the the younger brother, and he is. I think it's. I think we are in. He is the one that um, everybody's talking about at right. the moment. He's uh, the next big thing in in professional boxing. But just it was interesting. One of the lines in it was that he um, never wanted to be an amateur boxer. That he always wanted to be professional, like okay. all the time. Like never wasn't. Like, the Olympic dream wasn't his. Wasn't yeah. there. He just felt that he'd be better over um, over. Um, over in the professional ranks, so okay. yeah. That's in the mail, um, Mark Gallagher there. Alan, one of the reasons you've trekked up here as much as you uh, desperately wanted to get up <laughs> early, come up, read a ton of papers and give up your Sunday afternoon beyond just the, the appeal of that was you're very passionate about your 40th anniversary updated edition of Stand Up and Fight when Munster beat the All Blacks. I'll hold it up there because I know lots of you watching Facebook and Twitter and Periscope. Periscope. So, uh, talk to us about this, 40th anniversary, a lot of people would have thought, well, this ha if, if any aspect of Irish sport has been well and truly covered, it is Munster's defeat of the All Blacks. Mm. Uh, so clearly you're not going to give up your time <coughs> to come up with an updated version and look at this again. Yeah, well, I mean, the book is only in part about the match itself. I mean, <coughs> the book is sort of told in the in the style of a novel, really, and, and, and it, go it's, it begins in, in, in the... Uh, in 1876, which is when the first rugby club came into Limerick. Um, and, and it tries to, as well as telling the story about how Munster came to beat the All Blacks, which has is, which is got multiple strands to it and multiple big characters. The two biggest characters in the book are Jerry McLaughlin, uh, the prop forward, and Tom Kiernan, the coach. Um, but it also tries to explain why does the game still resonate? Why did it happen in Limerick? Why does it, why does it, why does it continue to be of importance in Limerick? And, explain why rugby came to matter so much to the people of Limerick. Um, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a book that has a lot of strands to it, I think. And the reason I updated it was because I was interested to see um, how life has been like. The book, book basically ends, it. the first edition was published in 13 years ago, um, how, the, how life has been um, for the Munster players since 1978. Um, and two of, them, two of the starting 11, uh, starting 15, have died. Um, um, so I spoke to them about all kinds of different things, about their their personal lives, about how their bodies have have uh, have, have, have have stood up. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting when we've had a discussion. We started the show with a discussion about the physicality uh, of today's game. Um, well, one of the defining moments in that 1978 game was when Seamus Dennison tackled Stu Wilson. It's it's in the ad, the Guinness ad that you'd see. Um, ad nauseum for the last couple of months mm. and Seamus Dennison was 11 stone um, like if, if uh, you, you could not put him on a uh, on a pitch these days you, you'd be up for reckless endangerment mm -hmm. you know um, 
So a totally different era. Um, and Seamus Dennison is one of, of, of multiple players who have had, uh, he's had, I think he's had uh, both hips replaced. Um, there's been any number of re you know, replacement knees, replacement right. hips, back up back operations and they'd uh, all be a bit young to have that going on yeah yeah well they're they're you know they're in their 60s yeah. you know uh, but um, for, for for playing a sport that it was nothing like the physicality that we have today um, it does certainly wonder and, and some of them speculate in the book and, and, and worry about today's generation what what will today's generation be like you know when they're in their 60s and um, you know I, I would certainly worry about it um, but uh, yeah so look obviously the, the 40th anniversary was a a good peg uh, to update the book, um, but um, you know it's still in print uh, after 13 years, and mm. I hope it'll it'll good keep, sign. It, keep it going. And what do you find about rugby's place in Limerick then? Well, I, why why is it taking such a hold? Well, I I, I think it it took a hold because um, in 1876 uh, I, I I would have read a lot of um, material about society in Limerick City back then, and it was quite a miserable place. I mean, Frank. McCourt um, wrote uh, about um, life in, in the city 40 or 50 years later in the lanes of Limerick. Um, back, back when rugby first came into the game, it was introduced by um, Charles Barrington, who was a, sort of a, a posh, uh, you know, well-heeled well, um, well uh, Trinity College graduate. Um, and it's t it took hold in a city that had absolutely nothing for working class people to enjoy. There was no means of sort of popular enjoyment. Um, there was no university in the city. Um, there was, uh, there was. I think as it said, says in the book, there was 282 liquor shops in Limerick and two dentists. Um, it, it wasn't a, you, basically people were enduring life rather than enjoying it, and it gave the people something to latch onto, something mm -hmm. that they enjoyed, and it could have played to the Limerick characteristic about wanting to be tough. And in around that time, you know, the, the clubs that we still see today, Gary Owen, Young Munster. Shannon uh, came into being, and um, you know, so it, it has. People have said that in in um, up on say in the 1960s, rugby had only one equal in terms of its influence on local life, which was the Catholic Church. You know, right. Um, so was it always bigger in Limerick than the GA even? In the city, in the city, city. yeah, in yeah. the city, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in I mean, and, and rug, uh, hurling is now, um, you know, certainly rivaling uh, rugby in the city. I think when you see, you know, clubs like Napiersig um, exploding, um, and the schools change a little bit, or it's got a reach when in hurling. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, in the county, hurling has has, has always been the game. Um, but you know, we see players like Larry Maloney coming from Brewery, and we see Seamus Dennison coming from Abbey Field. Mm. Um, so it's uh, you and, know. and Limerick is unusual in that it would have the reputation as being a game for working class as well as the well-heeled types. That was always the great cliche. As well. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a cliche, you know, the dockers and the doctors side by side on, yeah. on Saturday afternoon. Um, but yes, yeah, cliches so are often true, I suppose. Well, true, yeah, but but but, but uh, Tom Kiernan, um, who was the mastermind ultimately of this victory, of, uh, one of the great servants of Irish rugby, um, phenomenal contribution to, to 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 the sport throughout his life. A uh, very compelling character, as I say, a big character in the book. Mm. Um, what type of character? Ah, he's, he's just driven, um, passionate, um, very, very well organised. Uh, I mean, this is an era when there was there was there were only two video recorders in all of Limerick City in, in 1978. He wanted to show the players what the All Blacks look back look like. Um, you know, the night before the game, so he had to go to extraordinary measures to get hold of a, a video clip of them playing in the early matches on the tour. He, a woman had to fly over to, to Shannon Airport with this videotape. They had to find um, this industrial unit on the outskirts of the city to load the videotape in. Um, but he, he, he went to those extremes mm. because he had been part of losing um, Munster teams, both as a player uh, and as a coach. Um, so unbelievably driven, a little bit of a, a Joe Schmidt type character um, who would think about nothing but mm. uh, rugby, um, you know, okay. from the moment he got up. I interrupted the, interrupt you there, so I'm sensing slight reservations over the dockers and doctors cliche. Well, no, it's just, it's just, it is a cliche, and, and I think one should should try to take on and and um, explore uh, cliches. And 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 he threw it at me. He, uh, the first interview I did with him down in Cork, uh, he said, I'm sick and tired of listening to this. Nobody has an explanation for why it happened. You know, so I, I kind of saw that as a challenge. You know, you know, why did rugby take hold in Limerick? And 
It was only when you investigated and looked into what the city was like when it took hold that one could understand why the, the game came to mean so much. I would certainly think the lack of a university um, was, was, was significant. Um, and, and Limerick is a very work, and still is to this day, a very working class city. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's certainly one of the... Uh, areas you explore, areas yeah, very explore, interesting. Yeah. And what's, um, what's 78's place then in Limerick Rugby now as Ireland have beaten the All Blacks? And it, I guess with each passing year it feels like that bit further yeah. away. In, well, in look, I, 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 it, has its own, it has its own legend, you know. I, I don't think it's ever really going to, to dim. Mm. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, diff the players, one of the sections uh, in, in the updated edition... Um, uh, there's a, a little cameo where all the players are in the, the new East Stand in 2008 when the new Thoman Park is being uh, opened, officially opened with the, the game against the, uh, the All Blacks. Yeah, and of course, the night of the Hacker with the Munster Yeah, players. the famous yeah. Hacker. And uh, Munster, of course, leading with five minutes to go. And uh, Moss, Keane, uh, Moss Keane sort of commented, all the players were together, and he says, I hope they hold on. We've had enough of this bloody thing now. <laughs> you know? uh, whereas Jerry McLaughlin says he was cheering for Munster, but there was a little part of him holding back. I say so. And um, ultimately, I think they were probably pleased that they, they're, they're the only Munster team to have won it. But Donald Caniff, the captain, was absolutely thrilled, as, as were all the players when Ireland f finally became the second team to, to beat them. And now, of course, it's now becoming commonplace. Commonplace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sounds fascinating. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a li it's a book about Limerick and Limerick, and Limerick rugby. Yeah, much, and it's a book about personalities. And um, Jerry McLaughlin, uh, as an interviewee, is a little bit like our friend uh, Mr. Genge. You know, he just uh, shoots from the lip. And um, the first interview I did with him, uh, he, he was just back in, in, in Limerick, having spent 15 years in in Wales, didn't care who he upset. Yeah. Um, second time I interviewed him, he realised he'd gone too far. He, I could barely get him to confirm that his name was Jerry <laughs> McLaughlin. Um, but subsequently, I think I did about five or six interviews with him okay. for the book. Um, but a phenomenal character, and um, you know, deservedly, I think that the uh, the lead character in the book, which, as I said, written in a bit, a little bit like a novel. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well. Uh, certainly available for Christmas. Stand up and fight. It's the updated anniversary edition by Alan English. Thank you so much for coming up. I know it's yeah, a bit of a slog. Yeah, no, I, I listen to the you. program every week, so it was, it, was, it, was, it was great to be invited. Great. No, well, anytime you're more than welcome. And then, Marie, you're an old hand regular at this stage, journalist and broadcaster, Marie Crow. Thank you for coming in. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sundays. We're back next week. <laughs>